This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks a lot, Brennan. I'd like to thank uh, all the grad students for organizing this. It is a real honor to be invited by the grad students, which is a good indication that their memories of my plant breeding 4030 lectures is fading away. So, <laughs> uh, I think we've got the, the sound issues worked out here, uh, but if, if uh, you're having trouble on Zoom, just send a chat and Kevin here will give me the high sign. Uh, and welcome, John Mahoney. Uh, it's good to see you again. My former summer scholar who's a grad student at UConn. Uh, maybe future postdoc, we'll see. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about our hemp breeding program and I wanna highlight here uh, at the beginning that uh, I do have a grad student and postdoc working on this project now. So Jacob, who's here, who started in the fall, and Craig Carlson, who did his PhD in my lab and is online. Uh, but they only started in the fall, and we've been doing this for about two years now. So a lot of the work has been done by our technical staff. So I really need to highlight uh, a lot of work that was done by uh, Jamie Crawford and Julie Hansen in Don Vian's lab, and uh, Rebecca Wilk, who is my uh, lead technician. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little background about cannabis. Uh, and let me just say, uh, there's a dual meaning in my title from gray area to gold rush. Uh, it's not only referring to the economic situation and the interest in cannabis right now, uh, but it also refers to uh, the scientific situation, right? So a lot of the information about cannabis is in a gray area. It's on websites that I probably shouldn't be navigating to on the Cornell network. Uh, and uh, now that uh, hemp is legal and cannabis overall is uh, fully legal in Canada, there is a real gold rush for scientists. Uh, there is, we learn new things every day uh, about cannabis because there's been very little research on cannabis. So it's really important to make this point clear from the outset. Uh, there are some disputes about the botany of cannabis, that there are three species or three subspecies, indica, sativa, and ruderalis. Uh, they've been interbred at this point, and we don't really have access to uh, the native land races. So uh, I'm just gonna call it cannabis sativa. The real distinguish, distinction between marijuana and hemp is a legal one. Uh, the level of THC. Uh, so hemp, cannabis sativa has been bred uh, for hemp to produce grain fiber and now CBD with a percentage of THC below 0.3, while marijuana has been bred to produce high levels of THC. So really they are the products of breeding, uh, but the legal definition, which is really important for growers uh, and for regulators, and for law enforcement uh, refers to uh, the level of THC, not really the botany. So we grew a lot of hemp in this country. Uh, in this area, we grew a lot of hemp during colonial days. Uh, hemp could actually be used to pay your taxes to the king. And that hemp was used to make a rope and sailcloth for the British Navy. Uh, we also used it during wartime. So the biggest hemp cultivation in the U.S. was in 1943. And you see here, I think we have to trust the uh, USDA statistics. Uh, about 180,000, 200,000 acres of hemp uh, grown in 1943. And if you, if you look at the uh, states that are involved here, this was... Wisconsin early on, Kentucky, Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa, Indiana. Those were the main states, okay? Uh, it was uh, largely illegal or very difficult to grow after 1937. There was a tax that was imposed on cannabis that uh, essentially made it too expensive to grow. And then the Controlled Substance Act in 1971 uh, made cannabis illegal to grow overall. Uh, in 2014, though, in the Farm Bill, 
there were provisions enacted to allow pilot programs authorized by states uh, to grow hemp for research. And that could be agronomic research. Uh, New York interpreted to it to also include market research. Uh, so New York approved its pilot program in late 2015 and uh, Cornell got its grower's license. We got license number two in the state uh, in early 2016 and we started cultivating hemp at the end of that growing season. Uh, so here's the, the interesting situation is that we have a reasonable market for hemp products. Uh, it's not a huge market in 2017, $820 million. Uh, it's a very diverse market as you see, but at that time, all of the hemp products were being imported because we didn't grow any hemp really. So $105 million uh, market for textiles entirely coming from China. And Patagonia has a pretty good line of uh, hemp clothing uh, that you can purchase. Uh, there's a huge market for hemp seed oil incorporated into personal care products, lotions, soaps, lip balm. So uh, that picture is products made in Newark, New York, uh, soap and the deodorant and the lip balm. And then there are very interesting industrial applications. Uh, that's a picture of a hemp insulation that could be a replacement for fiberglass wall insulation made by a company in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, it's also a fantastic food product. Uh, so the grain goes into the granola, so that Evoke is a granola product made in Rochester. And Genesee Brewery has just announced three flavors of beer that they're going to make from hemp grain. Uh, so very diverse market opportunities uh, up until now, entirely supplied by hemp imported into this country. That's why legislators were so interested in legalizing hemp why don't we just grow it here and fully, you know, fully market the opportunities here. Now, the big opportunity and the big explosion, the gold rush, is in CBD, cannabidiol, a compound. We'll talk about the biochemistry a little bit later. Uh, in the same biosynthetic pathway as THC, but very different pharmacological activity. Uh, so it has been approved as a medicine very effective treatment for childhood epilepsy, reducing daily seizures for children with Dravet syndrome from 25 to 30 seizures a day down to maybe one or two. So very effective for epilepsy. Uh, and then a lot of anecdotal data. So this market is spreading through word of mouth uh, that it is effective for other neuromuscular uh, symptoms, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's disease, restless leg syndrome, it's also effective against anxiety. Uh, and there are good uh, animal studies uh, with anxious mice. They become less anxious. Uh, uh, and it helps people sleep. It also seems to be very effective for chronic pain. So actually in the medical marijuana programs, uh, the most common prescribed product is a 50-50 mixture of CBD and THC. The CBD counteracts the psychoactive effects of THC and provides a broader spectrum of pharmacological uh, benefits. Uh, so that market is estimated to grow to potentially 2 billion in 2020. It may already be at 2 billion and 22 billion by 2022. So 90% of the hemp growers in the country are growing to produce CBD. So here's the other aspect of the gold rush. Uh, the acreage has expanded, has tripled every year for the last three years. And I expect it will triple again this year. So again, according to the 2014 Farm Bill, states had to pass individual pilot programs. By now, 41 states have enacted hemp bills. You can see those white states that are the, uh, the ones left out. I was just giving a, a seminar at Ohio State. Uh, no hemp in Ohio. Uh, we have some guests here from Iowa. There's no hemp in Iowa. <laughs> so Corteva, what have you been doing out there? <laughs> uh, South Dakota actually had legislation that they just voted down and the governor is pretty firmly against hemp in South Dakota. Uh, Georgia's working on it, Texas is working on it. Uh, but 
the big states are Kentucky, Oregon, Colorado, uh, North Carolina, and New York. We're the top five. Uh, so again, starting in 2016, pretty much the first opportunity for states to grow after the 2014 Farm Bill, about 10,000 acres. And by now, this year, I predict we'll be up to 250 to 300,000 acres nationwide. Uh, the other aspect of Gold Rush for the students in the audience, audience is in jobs. So I've seen an estimate of, in the next two years, 500,000 jobs in the cannabis industry. And we will be launching certificate programs and MPS programs. Carlin Buckler is teaching a course in cannabis biology this fall. Uh, so students will start signing for, up for that on Monday. Uh, so in response uh, to this opportunity to start cultivating hemp in New York, uh, Chris Smart, the director of the School of Integrated Plant Science, assembled a multidisciplinary team. We've been working very well together, together with 10 Cornell Cooperative Extension specialists across the state and with New York State Ag and Markets. We have conference calls every two weeks uh, covering pretty much all aspects of the crop from plant breeding to pathology, entomology, seed science, biochemistry, tissue culture, microbiome research. Uh, we're trying to do it all. And I think we probably now have the largest and most comprehensive academic research team in the country. Part of that is because of very enthusiastic and generous support from the governor and the legislature. So in early 2017, the governor committed $5 million for academic research in hemp. Some of that went to Morrisville State College, uh, but we at Cornell have benefited from uh, almost $4 million of that $5 million so far, including $2 million uh, for our breeding program. So cannabis is a very diverse crop. You saw the diversity of market classes, market opportunities, but it's also grown in very different ways uh, in the field. Either can be grown in the greenhouse or in controlled environment <coughs> settings. For CBD, it's grown similar to tobacco or tomatoes. So in Kentucky and North Carolina, it has been relatively easy for the tobacco growers to transition to hemp, uh, grown under raised beds with trickle irrigation, uh, planted from transplants, hand harvested, dried in tobacco barns, and hand stripped. So a lot of that is hand labor. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We have some growers that are growing hemp for baby greens uh, and marketing it at Whole Foods in New York City for $12 or $13 a clamshell. Uh, but traditionally, hemp has been grown for grain as a field crop, uh, planted with a cereal grain drill, harvested with a combine, and for fiber, again, planted in high density as a field crop, harvested with a sickle bar mower, and baled with a large round baler. Uh, so quite a, a diversity of cultivation methods. It's also a very interesting crop in terms of its reproductive biology. And... You know, I've done a lot of work on willow, which is another dioecious crop. We've been doing a lot of work recently studying the sex determination region and sex chromosomes in the Salicaceae. So it's a, a logical transition for us to start working on uh, sex dimorphism and uh, uh, sexually dimorphic patterns of gene expression in hemp. The cultivars are either dioecious, uh, meaning pretty much a 50-50 mix, of male plants, which you can see here senesce before the females, uh, producing the pollen and the females setting the, the grain heads here. Uh, there are some variants that are monoecious, that produce both male and female flowers on the grain heads. Those are some of our best producing grain varieties right now, or dual purpose grain and fiber cultivars. But for CBD and THC, you want to grow unpollinated female plants. Uh, those chemicals are made on trichomes on the uh, bracts of the female floral tissue. And when the females are pollinated, the levels of CBD or THC go down two to threefold. So uh, there are tricks to manipulating uh, floral development in cannabis. Uh, gibberellic acid promotes masculinity. 
ethylene promotes femininity, female flowers. Uh, so you can use ethylene inhibitors to induce male uh, flowers on female plants. The pollen produced from those uh, male flower parts only have X chromosomes. So when you use that X pollen to pollinate the female plants, all of the seed is XX. So we call that feminized seed, uh, and it's a way to plant out a field and only get female plants, which is what you want. Right now, that feminized seed for CBD lines is selling for a dollar a seed, a dollar a seed. Uh, so those folks who are very good at doing this treatment, inducing male flowers on female plants and generating you know, tons of feminized seed are making hundreds of millions of dollars right now. Uh, we have some ideas about manipulating sex and maybe uh, generating some sterile plants. Uh, but again, we learn more about hemp every day. Uh, one thing that uh, Jacob has, has done, he has really contributed a lot over the last few months. Uh, there are some Y chromosome specific markers and uh, Jacob has converted those into Cas markers. So now we have good uh, genetic tests for male and female for XX or XY. Those genetic tests are commercially available as well. Uh, so commercial growers can test their plants. The only issue there is these companies are charging $10 per sample. So if you want to do a whole field, uh, it's not practical at this point. We can do it for our trials because we're only putting a couple hundred plants out in the field. So doing 2,000 tests, I think we're only $1.50, maybe $2 a sample uh, to get these assays done. So uh, this is sort of an outline of the way I'm going to organize the rest of my talk. As we think about establishing a breeding program for a new crop, uh, these are sort of the steps that I envision that we need to take. We need to assemble some germplasm. We need to characterize that germplasm and develop phenotyping techniques and look at the traits that we want to start to select for. So I'll talk about the trials that we've done over the last two years for grain, fiber, and dual purpose grain and fiber crops. Uh, and we've also done one year of trials to look at CBD slash THC. <laughs> Those are the main traits there. Uh, We've done some work together with Cornell Cooperative Extension to model the cost of production. That's important in any breeding program because you want to breed for traits that will improve the profitability of the crop uh, and help us to establish an idiotype uh, for what we're breeding. What are our breeding goals? And then based on the biology, the traits that we want to select for, the variation that we see in the germplasm that we have, uh, and the crossing techniques, uh, Cannabis is a wind-pollinated crop, uh, highly outbreeding, highly heterozygous. Uh, we need to develop a breeding strategy and marker systems that we can incorporate to do marker-assisted selection. I just showed you one for uh, male, male-female sex, uh, but we'd eventually like to be able to develop markers for genomic selection. Okay. So the first step, assembling germplasm. So the rest of the breeders in the room, when they think about assembling germplasm, when Mark thinks about uh, adding diversity to his wheat breeding program, he might go to the GRIN database and say, oh, let me find some lines from Turkey or some lines from uh, other places to incorporate. Uh, so the USDA used to have a hemp germplasm collection. When you go to GRIN, you see that uh, there are 150 accessions in the database, zero available. That's because that collection was destroyed after the passing of the Controlled Substance Act. So we do not have a U.S. hemp germplasm collection. Uh, the Vavilov Institute has a hemp germplasm collection that's been rather difficult for people to access. Uh, I was reading a paper yesterday about a Canadian, one of the pioneering Canadian researchers in the 70s who did a diversity study. He accumulated 150 accessions, including 75 or 80 from the Vavilov Institute. Uh, when the Canadian government found out that he had all this, they destroyed his whole collection. 
Uh, my colleague George Weeblin at University of Minnesota collected a lot of uh, feral populations. So that's another thing that we can look at is uh, there is a lot of ditchweed out there. I showed you the states that uh, grew all the hemp in World War II, Iowa, uh, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Nebraska, and those states still have a lot of feral hemp uh, on the landscape. George Weeblin characterized some of that feral hemp under DEA uh, scrutiny. And then when he was done with the study, they destroyed it all. So uh, that has been the history of trying to accumulate hemp germplasm over the last couple of decades. Uh, but now with the 2018 Farm Bill, hemp has been taken off of the Schedule I controlled substance list. Uh, so now we should be able to work freely without the scrutiny of the DEA, although we still need to prove to people that it's hemp and not marijuana, right? Uh, so this is an interesting map because you see a lot of hemp where I don't really think hemp is growing. This includes cannabis sativa, uh, and it's actually on five state noxious weed lists. And I'm not sure they, they fully interpreted weed there properly. <laughs> Because if you look at West Virginia, it's only in a few counties in West Virginia. It's not like an invasive weed, but it's a weed, and they put it on the noxious weed list in West Virginia. Uh, in Minnesota, I, I'm more confident that ditch weed uh, really has spread uh, outside of its range of cultivation. Uh, so we do have intentions now that we can collect hemp freely without the scrutiny of the DEA of uh, doing some uh, excursions to the Midwest and finding some feral hemp populations. We have found uh, three feral hemp populations in New York already, uh, but it was pretty well eradicated. So the other possibility is to look to the native range of hemp, uh, which is in Central Asia. And I was very lucky to uh, visit Kazakhstan last year where they have 200,000 acres of wild hemp growing, and maybe we can cultivate those relationships. That was related to our historic relationship in Geneva in the uh, assembly of the apple germplasm collection uh, and numerous collection trips that my colleagues made uh, to build our apple germplasm collection in Geneva. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can do the same thing with cannabis, uh, but it is highly illegal in Kazakhstan. So we will need to have some influence, uh, some influence on the government <laughs> uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, maybe find an oligarch who can help us uh, make some collections there in Kazakhstan. Also Pakistan, Uzbekistan, India, you can see how hemp moved from that native range uh, around the world uh, as it was cultivated uh, over the last thousand years. Uh, so the other question is the diversity of that germplasm. And the current marijuana germplasm really has very low diversity. So this is one of the better examples. Uh, this is a 3D PCA uh, on the web that you can play around with. You can click on each point and see which sample it is. Uh, this is a company called Phylos in Portland, Oregon. And for full disclosure, I'm serving on their scientific advisory board right now. but. Uh, they had a business of collecting samples, doing amplicon sequencing, and then creating this uh, diversity map on the website uh, so that everyone who has their own genetics, uh, this is a term we learn early on in the hemp business, is that if you're in the business, you have your own genetics, uh, which means where did you get your own genetics? Uh, and how is it yours now? Because uh, I'm a breeder. Uh, and in order to protect that and demonstrate that your own genetics is different from anyone else's, you would send a sample to Phylos and they would put it up on the Phylos galaxy here and uh, you could prove that your stuff is different from everyone else's. So just looking at the color codes here, uh, hemp are the yellowish uh, dots here. The green is what people are calling land races. And again, these are just samples that are submitted 
by people willing to pay $300 per sample uh, to get it onto the Bylos Galaxy. The CBD lines are all over here on the left in light blue, and you see there is a lot of relatedness here in CBD land. And uh, the light purple and uh, red here are marijuana lines. Uh, so that's very interesting. Go play around with it. It's a very cool interface. It's something that we hope to uh, sort of reproduce ourselves. Uh, we've got some GBS samples being sequenced right now, but we hope to go to a sequence capture genotyping system, uh, which has worked very well in poplar and willow. So uh, we have accumulated germplasm as we have been able to. All of the commercial cultivars are protected by those breeding companies. They won't allow us to breed with them pretty much. We have one or two relationships with breeding companies. Uh, but the rest of the breeding companies are very protective. In fact, uh, some of the CBD, most popular CBD companies, will not send me material just to put in trials because they're afraid that I will start breeding with it. Uh, so people are very protective of their germplasm and you really have no idea uh, what its pedigree is, where it came from, whether it's hemp or not hemp. Uh, so we hope to reproduce this ourselves. Okay, moving on to phenotyping and trialing. This is not only for us to demonstrate uh, the utility of different cultivars for our growers in New York, but also uh, for us to look at the uh, traits of the germplasm that we have available. Uh, so we've been doing this in small plot trials, uh, sharing a lot of equipment with the Sorrels group, so we appreciate that. We're very grateful for that. Uh, planting uh, grain and dual purpose trials at 15 live seeds per square foot, which is about 25 pounds to the acre. Uh, the fiber is planted at a higher density, 30 live seeds per square foot, or about 50 pounds to the acre and evaluating all of these traits as best we can. Uh, so hemp is a very finicky crop to establish in the field. It has very specific uh, depth requirements, moisture requirements, it does not like flooding at all. Uh, so that's one thing we've learned already in just two years. In 2017, we had very good establishment and a good crop. After it germinates, it will get about four to five inches tall and then, then sort of sit there for three weeks. Uh, so I'll show you last year, that was a problem because we had about five or six weeks with no rain. But in 2017, we had nearly perfect growing conditions and you see after seven weeks, uh, that stuff is five or six feet tall. Uh, we're using a small plot combine to harvest this and now we have another Almeco combine in Geneva in addition to the one we have here in Ithaca uh, to measure grain yields. And in 2017, we tested 13 uh, commercially available certified grain cultivars and got on average uh, about 1,400 pounds to the acre. The best cultivar in the best plot, best trial was uh, nearly 2,400 pounds to the acre, where the average Canadian yields is 800 to 900 pounds to the acre. So I think we have very good potential uh, to get high yields of grain production here in New York State. Uh, and it could be a good rotation field crop with our other uh, field crops uh, and offer more opportunities for farmers. That grain is high in oil, so 35 to 36% oil with a very healthy mix of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. Again, that oil is a good culinary oil, not a cooking oil, but for salad dressings, pestos, other uh, low temperature applications, because it has a very low smoking temperature. It's a good replacement for fish oil because of that omega-6 and omega-3 balance there. And again, that oil is also a very good oil for cosmetic or personal care products. It's also actually a good wood preservative and a good paint. Once you press for that oil, uh, there's a high percentage of protein in the press cake. Uh, so this is from the bulk seed, about 26 to 27 percent protein. Uh, so in the press cake, you can get around 50 percent protein. So that's another good market opportunity. 
is you know, gluten-free, soy-free, sorry about that, gluten-free, soy-free, uh, GMO-free, uh, often grown organic because there are no pesticides registered for hemp right now. Uh, so if you use organic fertilizer on certified organic land, it's really not that much different from conventional cultivation uh, and uh, can be a good source of protein for plant-based meats, for high protein smoothie drinks and, and for athletes. It's another market that we're uh, trying to tap into as well as for animal feeds. So there are groups now trying to get hemp research done to have it approved as an animal feed additive. There are studies already, research studies that show it's a very good poultry feed and beef growers in Colorado are really pushing it because they're, some of them are already using hemp and getting very high quality beef. Uh, so in 2018, those trials were done only in Ithaca and Geneva. In 2017 and 2018, we expanded to include Long Island and Z, uh, so covering the full latitudinal range in New York State. Uh, planted still a little bit late from June 8th to June 20th, but uh, one of the main issues that we've had is in acquiring seed, getting it imported under DEA restrictions. Uh, so we've always been a little bit late this year. We're going to be spot on time, I'm sure of it. Uh, so six sites, and we also did some larger strip trials uh, for combine demos. So I put up the list of cultivars here. One thing we learned in 2017 is that we needed to break up our trials into blocks based on maturity date. Uh, so we put the early maturing grain varieties in one block, the later maturing uh, dual purpose varieties in another block, and then the fiber varieties, which we're gonna cut with a sickle bar mower in a third block. So that's how I've got them organized here. One thing you see is that uh, there are big issues with seed quality, uh, that the seed laws are really not being enforced in hemp right now in the US. Uh, and when we get uh, seed lots from uh, a breeder in Oregon, he sent us seed with 39% germination. Uh, most of the commercial seed lots that we've gotten have been pretty good, over 85%. Uh, but some of them coming in from Europe, not so good. Uh, there are also differences in thousand kernel weight. Uh, so you can see one here at 22 and uh, one here under 12. So that's a trait that we're interested in looking at is uh, seed size, how it relates to early seedling vigor, and again, yield of oil and protein. So 2018 was not a perfect growing season. Uh, again, five to six weeks with no rain after planting. That allowed the weeds to take off as the hemp was sitting there that tall. And in fact, uh, some of our early maturing grain cultivar plots, we lost to weeds, we lost it to the pigweed. Uh, and then we got very heavy rain later in the season and hemp does not like flooding conditions. Uh, so our yields were much lower in 2018. Uh, highest grain yield there, averaging 800 pounds to the acre. Uh, keep this Pewter River uh, in mind here, because that's going to play into our longer term breeding strategies. Uh, looking at dual purpose cultivars, again, a lot of these have been bred in Italy, France, Poland, a couple from Canada here. Uh, this is the first uh, US certified cultivar from John McKay's company, New West Genetics in Colorado. And again, some that we've gotten from some breeders in Oregon. Just wanted to show you sort of the diversity of where our germplasm is coming from. Again, 2018 yields not nearly as good as we would hope based on our 2017 results. Definitely differences in site quality, Hemp is a very nitrogen demanding crop, we've learned that. And again, very intolerant of poorly drained soils. But we still have a lot more to learn about that. Uh, maybe a little bit of good news from 2018. We planted these larger two to three acre fields for combine demos a couple of weeks later than our cultivar trials. 
So they got the rain a little bit earlier, and uh, here in this field of Anka, which is a Canadian cultivar that is proving to be one of our better cultivars, we're, we got 1,300 pounds to the acre, dirty seed, you know, probably about 1,200 pounds clean. Uh, so again, that's, that's a reasonable yield, economically viable yield of seed. I think we can get it up over 1,400 to maybe 2,000 pounds to the acre commercially. Okay, looking at fiber, uh, the best fiber cultivars have been bred in Italy so far, uh, although we just imported nine cultivars from China. So we'll be comparing Chinese to Italian fiber cultivars this year. Uh, and in 2017, again, a pretty good growing season. By, the, by harvest time, they were eight to nine feet tall, uh, forming a nice dense canopy there which we harvest with a sickle bar mower. In 2017, we just weighed the fresh weight with all the leaves, dried a subsample, uh, but we realized that's not ideal. We got some criticism for not redding it. So this would be the normal process for fiber hemp is to cut it and leave it on the field to ret, uh, allowing nutrients to leach out of the tissue back to the soil, but also encouraging microbial growth to separate the high quality bast fiber on the outside of the stem from the woody herd tissue in the middle so that it can then go to be decorticated and separated into those two product lines, the long fiber and the woody herd, fiber, uh, woody herd tissue. So we attempted this uh, in our trials, doing some redding uh, to get then dry straw weight uh, and again, we were getting reasonably competitive, commercially viable yields of redded straw between three to four tons to the acre. And if the bass fiber is about 20 to 25%, you're getting about 1,000 pounds of high quality bass fiber that you could use for rope or fabric or biocomposite materials. So we will continue to do that type of cultivar evaluation trying to encourage a grain and fiber industry to develop in New York State. We really need a fiber processor to come in and install the decorticating equipment uh, so that we can start to incorporate hemp into some of these uh, novel biocomposite materials. So BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche are using hemp compressed panels in some of their automobiles because it is lighter and just as strong as other materials that they can use. Okay, moving on to look at CBD. That's what everyone's interested in. Uh, on the left there, you see a commercial CBD field growing in Orange County. That was planted from a clone. So it looks very uniform there in the field. Uh, we planted from seeds last year that we started in the greenhouse and we didn't have those sex markers developed yet. So we were hoping to see the male plants. We didn't have any feminized seed either. So we needed to uh, wait for them to flower to remove the male plants. Uh, some of our lines did that in the greenhouse, uh, but even though we let them get way too tall before we planted them, many of them did not flower. And we were out there every day or every other day calling out the male plants. Uh, so that was a lot of work. Uh, it's why growers are willing to pay a dollar per seed for feminized seed right now is because if you plant dioecious plants, you have a lot, a huge labor, labor requirement going out there culling out male plants every day as they come to flower. I also did not have a good representat representative sample of commercially available cultivars. We really had uh, lines from two breeders, one in Las Vegas and one in Oregon, uh, as well as a couple of other lines that we picked up, uh, but these were not stable, as you're gonna see, not stable commercially ready CBD lines. Uh, this year, I've been scouring the internet, talking to seed companies, and we have a pretty good represent, representative group of 30 cultivars, both feminized seed and female clones, and some dioecious lines that will sort out the males with molecular markers ready to go for our trials this year. 
So we planted on two sites, one in Geneva, one in Ithaca, at Bluegrass Lane, under plastic, raised beds with plastic and trickle irrigation. Uh, but as you know, in actually, I think this was right after our field day in the second week of August, where we got three and a half inches of rain that day. Uh, not great for a field day. <laughs> uh, we had standing water in that field, and one thing we learned about hemp is it does not tolerate standing water. Within a week or so, many of those plants died. That was a similar situation for some of our commercial growers. They lost anywhere from 25 to 50% of their plants if they were on a poorly drained site. Some of them did okay with the raised beds, but uh, hemp does not tolerate flooding. And when you think of where the CBD hemp industry has developed in Colorado and Oregon, that probably has not been a typical problem in those environments. Uh, we sampled individual plants in our CBD trial for cannabinoid analysis. Uh, so that picture on the left is how we clipped the entire shoot tip there, and we would mill that entire thing. So it includes uh, leaves and stems, as well as the little flower bracts. We harvested whole plants and hung them in the greenhouse to dry. Uh, this is pretty typical of, of how many of the commercial uh, producers did it this year in a barn with lots of fans, and maybe they had some dehydrators going on in there, dehumidifiers. Uh, and that's what you get on the end. That picture on the right is uh, dried floral material, which we were then stripping by hand. And again, that was the industry standard at that point. There are some machines that you can run these stems through to strip them off, uh, but a lot of it is hand work. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about CBD biochemistry. Uh, CBD and THC, as well as CBC, are all derived from a common precursor, CBGA, uh, which is converted by three highly uh, similar enzymes, TH THCA synthase, CBDA synthase, and CBCA synthase. Uh, they are all over 90% similar at the protein level. Uh, so one thing that uh, Jacob is very interested in doing will be a part of his dissertation research is to do some directed evolution studies to see uh, what is involved in uh, basically converting a CBDA synthase to a THCA synthase or a CBCA synthase. Uh, they are, those genes are also highly duplicated in the genome. And I'm going to show you that uh, actually the distinction between a hemp type plant and a marijuana type plant lies in a mutation in mutations in the THCA or CBDA synthase genes. So lines with a functional CBDA synthase have non-functional or pseudogenes at THCA synthase. Uh, lines that have a deletion in the CBDA synthase, so a non-functional CBDA synthase, have functional THCA synthases. And we can distinguish those with uh, co-dominant markers. Okay, uh, so the key thing is that as you're growing these CBD lines, which really have been crosses between hemp and marijuana, you need to make sure that your THC levels do not rise above 0 0.3. Uh, so that is a matter of good farming because the CBD and THC starts to accumulate at a certain point after the start of flowering in the female flowers. Uh, but the THC levels will continue to rise as the plants get older. Uh, so we've done all of this work in collaboration with Josh, Josh Rose, both with Trevor Yeats, who's in the room, and Glenn Philippe, uh, postdocs of Joss's. Uh, so Trevor did all of our 2017 samples and Glenn analyzed uh, about 1,200 of our samples in 2018. And uh, these are the CBD concentrations that we got from that material, upwards of 8%. Uh, commercially, people are getting, hoping for 10 to as high as 14%. Uh, so these lines were not really great, uh, averaging, you know, 5% CBD. But the bigger issue is that some of these were producing a lot of THC. 
Uh, they had not been stabilized for low THC uh, by these two breeders that I got them from. In fact, you know, you see lines that were close to 3% THC. Uh, so we do have a DEA registration for the marijuana drug code. Uh, so that's, that's the way I think we can continue to work on these lines if we have the approval from the state as well. So this is an issue. Uh, we also see a diversity of other cannabinoids, CBC and CBG, and there's good evidence that a mixture of cannabinoids also has a pharmacological effect. It's not just purified uh, CBD. That certainly does have certain effect, but a combination of cannabinoids uh, can uh, invoke a different pharma pharmacological effect. So people are very interested in looking at lines with different concentrations of the other minor cannabinoids. So to look at the economics, we also needed to measure biomass yield. Uh, so again, we stripped all of those plants by hand, got about double the yield at Bluegrass Lane than we did in Geneva, uh, averaging about a pound per plant, which is, yeah, pretty good rule of thumb average for the industry. Uh, so now that gave us the opportunity to do some overall economic analysis. Uh, John Hanchar and CCE did this. Uh, so first looking at grain or fiber, he estimated the input costs. The cost of hemp of grain or fiber seed is about 250 a pound, 25,000 pound seed per pound. Uh, so not a dollar per seed. Uh, because you plant at a higher density, the fiber input costs are a little bit higher. He estimated about a thousand pounds of grain yield at a dollar ten per pound, uh, so eleven $1 hundred dollars or so uh, gross revenue for grain. Eight thousand pounds of fiber of dry straw yield at ten cents a pound, you get about eight hundred. So it's in the range of the revenue that you might get from a current field crop if you can do a dual purpose grain and fiber harvest you'll increase your revenues. Okay, here's the gold rush. Uh, growing CBD hemp in that horticultural setting is very labor intensive right now. People are estimating 15 to $20,000 of input costs per acre in the cost of seed, all that plastic mulch and irrigation, but a lot of hand labor. The average price for CBD hemp is about $4 per percent CBD per pound. So if you're averaging 10% CBD, you can get about $40 per pound. If you're getting a pound per plant and planting in uh, you know, six by six or six by eight spacing, uh, that's about 1,400 plants to the acre. You're averaging 1,400 pounds at $40 per pound, $56,000 gross revenue per acre. So those are the back of the envelope calculations that people are doing that has encouraged this tripling of hemp acreage every year for the last three years. Net returns of over $20,000 per acre. I don't think that's gonna last uh, because of the labor demands. We can't keep tripling our labor force in this current environment. So I think very quickly, we're gonna to move to a cultivation system that is based on field crops, dioecious field crops planted mechanically, harvested mechanically. Uh, so we are now breeding, our idiotype is a dual purpose uh, CBD and grain cultivar. Uh, if we get a fiber market in New York State, then we'll look at CBD and fiber. Uh, but I have already seen uh, commercial harvesting from a combine with a modified conveyor system that collects the fine leafy material off the top of the combine sieve, directs that into a wagon, diverting the straw back on the field and collecting the grain in the bin of the combine. So a dual purpose grain and CBD harvest. And I think we have some material that uh, can help us get to that point. So if you look at this cultivar here, Nebraska feral that we got from a breeder in Oregon, produced uh, about three to 4% CBD, while also producing about 800 pounds to the acre of grain. Uh, some of these other ones, uh, Pewter River and uh, Sterling Gold, also produce decent yields of grain, 
So we anticipated doing some crosses of those with some of our high CBD lines like A2R4 and ACDC. The issue that we ran into as Jacob has developed markers for this uh, functional and non-functional CBDA synthase is we can now predict which lines are marijuana type and which lines are hemp type based on the presence of those functional, non-functional CBDA synthase markers. Initially, he saw very good correlation with uh, THC ratios with those markers. And then when we started looking at populations as we planted them out in the greenhouse to do crosses, we found that Pewter River was over 90% homozygous for the marijuana type, non-functional CBDA synthase. Sterling Gold, I think more than 80%, and only three individuals that were homozygous for the hemp type functional CBDA synthase. Here are about 15 individuals, right? So that's what we're selecting for are the hemp type uh, CBDA synthase genes and some of those populations, which came out hot in the field, we know uh, had marijuana type THC synthase genes. So we have some initial markers that we can use. We have some initial phenotypes and an idiotype that we're going for. Uh, but again, we're learning more about hemp. We have some crazy ideas about developing triploids and developing YY male lines. And uh, so hopefully come back in a few years and we'll have some innovative stuff. But right now we're, we're just learning every day. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap up. That's, uh, these are our future directions to continue to do outreach to growers in New York by evaluating cultivars this year. We'll have four CBD trial sites uh, with upwards of 30 different cultivars. We're working with com companies to establish certified seed production in New York, uh, building our germplasm collection, characterizing that for the traits that are important and for uh, genetic diversity, collaborating with biochemists to characterize cannabinoids and terpenes, and then figuring out what crazy uh, crossing methods we can use, whether we can inbred, inbreed and develop hybrid lines, or develop uh, sterile lines. Uh, those are the types of things we're starting to look at. And Matthew Willman has been working on transformation for eventual CRISPR transformation, CRISPR modification. Uh, but hemp is a challenging crop to grow in tissue culture. Uh, so I need to thank my funding sources. All of our money so far has come from New York State, Department of Ag and Markets and Empire State Development. And uh, please check out our website and follow me on Twitter. So I'm happy to stop here and take any questions. Hi, Larry. Um, are there quality or purity standards relating to CBD sales in the US? So yeah, so the question is, are there purity or quality standards? Uh, so it's a little bit of a tricky thing because uh, CBD as a prescription medicine is not supposed to be sold outside of prescription, that prescription medicine situation. So the companies that are selling it uh, are selling it as a dietary supplement and uh, they're not really putting the CBD concentration on their labels. They're putting hemp extract uh, so no, the bottom line is there are, really are no standards. Uh, it's very iffy. You need to find a brand that you trust that is doing their own internal uh, standard quantification of their products. And it may be a pure CBD product or it may be a full spectrum hemp extract. There are of course very strict pharmacological standards for the prescription medicine. Do you, have you uh, measured inbreeding depression, I guess? Uh, we have not. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I know there are people that have been inbreeding their lines for quite a while, and there are F1 hybrids that are marketed, but we have not gotten that far ourselves. Well, I was just wondering about um, 
the idiot type of getting CBD and grain, I thought that the pollination reduced the CBD production. Yes. So how I mean, is there? Is it just like an I like? Are there some plants that do both well? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. So uh, if we kept those lines unpollinated, they would probably make eight percent CBD. But the fact that they're pollinated, it goes down probably to three to four percent. But yeah, I'm not fully convinced that. I think there's going to be variation in that decline in CBD production after pollination. If we can get trichome production on a wider diversity of foliar tissue outside of just the floral tissue, then we can maintain higher production of CBD. But it's, the bottom line is how much CBD can you produce per acre? So at a higher density, can you get the same amount of CBD per acre as in a low density horticultural planting where you have high concentration plants. So, so kind of along those lines, is that what is the link between pollination and CDC production? Is Can you decouple that uh, connection? <laughs> exactly, so that's a very good question. Uh, can we decouple and exactly what is happening upon pollination that's triggering that. I think there's some evidence that the trichomes are physically falling off. Is that right, Jacob? Maybe. Uh, so is, is, is that it, that it, the tr you're losing trichomes or is it a down regulation of the biochemical pathway? We really wanna do a time series of RNA-seq experiments to look at the changes in gene expression uh, in a very detailed way through, uh, through time at, in the floral maturation process to see if we can figure out what's going on. Is there ploidy variation in Kappa sativa? And has anybody thought about making auto polyploids? Yeah, so uh, we, we are thinking about that a lot because that's what we do in Willow. Uh, we make triploid Willow that grow very well. Uh, so Jacob has been very good at, at mining uh, the literature and, and there is some evidence of natural tetraploids in India, I believe. Uh, and there was a very recent report out, it's only uh, a preprint right now, uh, that Anandia Labs, which is one of the marijuana companies in Canada, has uh, doubled a genome and generated a tetraploid. Uh, hi. Um, are there any uh, efforts to uh, leverage um, the natural diversity in other members of the Cannabaceae, um, like hops, for example, for the improvement of hemp? Yeah, so the question is, can we interbreed hops into Cannabis sativa? Uh, not necessarily interbreed, but just use, um, you know, other genetic resources to maybe understand what's going on in hemp. Uh, yeah, I don't know a whole lot. I haven't had a whole lot of time to study the botanical diversity of the Cannabaceae. So I think there, there are opportunities there, but I'm not sure that, that I think there will be crossing barriers there. Yep. Uh, more urgently, we're interested in uh, pathogens that can cross over between hops and hemp. And we have some initial concerns about that. Maybe one more question from Ithaca before we go to the Zoom. Just on, our, just on a related note, are you connecting with the hops industry to look at drying or any uh, post-harvest mechanisms? Because it seems like they have a pretty good infrastructure already established. Yeah, so the question is, is there some overlap between hops producers and hemp producers? We do have some growers who grow both hops and hemp. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure that the volume of the hops drying systems will meet the needs of the hemp industry, but yes, people are looking at everything. Uh, tobacco drying system, hay drying systems, it's gotta be low temperature, but yeah. Okay, we have two questions from Zoom. First from Alfred Huo. Um, he asks, will CBGA affect tissue culture or plant regeneration? Is any research about blocking THC synthase to improve CBD? Right. So, yeah, that's certainly one of the targets of genetic modification would be a zero THC line uh, by knocking out THCA synthase. Uh, 
It is duplicated in the genome. Uh, some reports are at least seven copies upwards. I think there are reports of 20 to 30 copies of THCA synthase. But yeah, that is, that is a, a key sort of golden target would be to knock out THCA synthase. The other question, I'm not sure we know why hemp is so recalcitrant in tissue culture, uh, but I don't think it's related to cannabinoid biochemistry because that's only produced in the floral trichomes. Next from Shelby Ellison, how many of the CBD females turned hermaphroditic? <laughs> yeah, so hemp, that's a great question. Hemp is a very fickle plant and uh, regulating its sex and we definitely have already seen genotypic differences in how stable a female is. We have one line, clonal line in the greenhouse that we've grown for a year under high stress conditions, pot bound, low nutrient, and it has stayed female solidly. Other lines, uh, you fail to give them perfect water and they'll start making male parts. They go hermaphroditic. Uh, yeah, it'd be very interesting to try to sort out the genetic basis for that. Uh, and in our CBD trial, I think four of our lines went hermaphroditic. And again, it's driving us crazy because there's pollen being produced in the middle of our CBD field. Uh, final question from Ken. What concentrations of ethylene inhibitors work for sex mod modification of female lines? Yeah, so we based our research on a paper that just came out from Yukon. Uh, but we only did, in our experiments, we've only tried it on one line. They tried it on three lines and did see gene differences by genotype in the sensitivity to uh, silver thiosulfate, uh, which is the ethylene inhibitor that they use. So I think there, there are going to be genotypic differences in that hormonal control of flowering, which are probably related to the stability of femaleness versus hermaphroditic. We also tried, we tried to extend that study by using MCP, which is another commercial inhibitor of ethylene action used in the apple industry. Our particular line did not respond to MCP at all. Still totally female. And we're very interested in taking males and inducing female. So we wanna do a lot of work. We're doing that with Bill Miller in horticulture. All right, join me in thanking Larry again. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.